Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you're located. Welcome to the webinar, Sourcing from Asia in the Slowdown, presented by Gunjan Bagla. My name is Supriya Pandey, and I am a Senior Global Consultant at Amrit. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to go over a few logistical details. If you are logged in, you should see before you the first slide of the presentation. Please maximize this window and confirm that you can see the entire slide on your screen. You should also see a webinar applet, which will allow you to send us questions throughout the session. The speaker, Gunjan Bagla, will answer the questions either through the course of the session or at the very end. In case you run into any technical issues, please call 1-805-617-7001. You might be asked for a meeting ID, which you can retrieve from the confirmation email we sent you and it is also available at the bottom of the webinar applet. During the course of the webinar, we will be conducting interactive polls, if time permits, and would appreciate your participation. If there are any questions after the webinar, please do feel free to email us at usa at amrit.com. That's usa at a-m-r-i-t-t dot com. I would now like to go ahead and introduce the featured speaker, Gunjan Bagla. Gunjan Bagla is the Managing Director of Amrit and has over 25 years of industry experience in marketing and sourcing. A mechanical engineering graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Kanpur in India, Mr. Bagla holds an MBA with honors from Southern Illinois University. He has previously held senior positions in large corporations as well as been an entrepreneur himself. He also travels extensively to both India and China. Based in California, Gunjan is the author of the book, Business in 21st Century India, How to Profit Today from Tomorrow's Most Exciting Market, published in July 2008 by Warner Hatchet Books. Mr. Bagla also leads the executive seminar, Business with India, at Caltech, the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California. These seminars and books are a direct result of his work as a business consultant for major Western clients like Reckitt Benkiser, Midway, Vivendi, Paramount Farms, just to name a few. He has been quoted extensively in the LA Times and other global media. You can see a list of his speaking engagements on the Amrit homepage. His articles have appeared in Business Week, CIO Magazine, Purchasing Magazine, and many others. So without further ado, here is Gunjan Bagla. Well, thank you, Supriya, and welcome to all of you who are joining in across the country uh, to this webinar. Uh, we will go at a fairly rapid pace, and uh, we have uh, uh, some interesting material to cover uh, based on what is happening in the reality of sourcing today. Before I get started, let me define the lingo, uh, because this can confuse uh, people who are maybe not so familiar with the world of outsourcing and offshoring. So this is a simple matrix of whether the work is happening inside your company or outside of your company on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we are talking about whether the work is happening within your home country or outside the country. So work that happens in-house in your company is, of course, the top left. And work that is performed offshore by your own subsidiary is called offshoring, sometimes called captive offshoring. People talk about outsourcing, and it's important to remember that domestic outsourcing performed in country but outside your company actually far exceeds offshore outsourcing, uh, which is what gets all the press at times. So let's talk about why Asia is still hot. And I've added a few slides here. Uh, in the last couple of times. So often, uh, you, if you read the, the media or you watch television, you get the impression that, that Asia might be the problem. And when the president talked about jobs in Buffalo, not Bangalore, uh, and earlier when uh, world food prices were rising prior to the slowdown, uh, this was being attributed to China and India uh, by, by uh, uh, the previous administration. Uh, there was talk about there not being enough energy resources to be able to, uh, to for, for the uh, emerging world to, to survive. Uh, and, and of course, there's been a lot of reports about unsafe products being shipped out of, uh, out of the emerging 
emerging economies. Um, so this is the backdrop that, uh, that we are coming out of in the last several years. And uh, for those of us who are active in the world of offshore outsourcing, uh, we know that uh, this is only part of the truth. The world has become far more independent uh, than it used to be. And today, it has been clear for at least uh, 20 plus years that, uh, that this, uh, this interdependency makes it impossible for countries such as Japan, China, the United States, and the EU to disengage from one another. Uh, you can't really embargo away these issues. Uh, and uh, we really have to make sure that we understand this very well. At the same time, I think it's very clear that the West will continue to lead the world in many fields, uh, agriculture, space exploration, aviation, uh, higher education, research, uh, the list goes on and on. And uh, the West also leads, particularly the United States, also leads the world in terms of the way people think. So here I have a picture from a street in Bangalore, and you can see the golden arches. Uh, you can see the billboards. They're a little bit hazy, uh, but they definitely represent imagery that is very familiar uh, to, to Western eyes. It's more Western imagery than Indian imagery. And uh, this is because people in, in countries such as China and India do aspire to the American way of life. And this is not going to change any time soon. Let's talk a little bit about uh, our company, Amrit, and what we do, just so you know where I'm coming from. We are consultants helping Western companies to be able to deal with India, China, and other emerging economies. Uh, that's, that's my day job, and that's what my team and I do, helping people find products and services uh, that, that they may want to acquire from uh, emerging economies, and most of our work uh, is driven by an interest in China or India uh, and occasionally by other countries. We are a boutique consulting firm and each of our senior consultants has 20 plus years of industry experience. Uh, we also run workshops. I've been teaching at Caltech for many years and this summer I will be offering the same class at the University of California at Los Angeles. These are industry classes not meant for full-time students as much as they are for people out of, uh, people working in industry who want to use this in their day-to-day -day jobs. Uh, as Supriya mentioned, I'm also the author of this book, and what I'm going to present today is assimilated from our actual day-to-day -day consulting knowledge. Let me conduct a quick poll to find out a little bit about the audience here. Tell me, tell me what, what it is that you plan to source or are currently sourcing. Is it products or services? Is it consumer or business? And if you can take a moment to answer the poll. Also a good time to send me any questions via the interactive uh, question applet. Uh, if you have something, you can you can put up a question that I can try and answer. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Looks like we're evenly divided between consumer and business services, and there aren't any product people. So I will tailor my remarks to uh, to uh, service-oriented discussions. Um, and what the rest of the presentation follows a David Letterman-style top ten format, and I'm going to talk about the top ten reasons why you might have trouble uh, with uh, with outsourcing and offshoring, and how you can uh, overcome some of those problems. Uh, 
so often people look at outsourcing services and offshoring services as primarily a labor arbitrage game and you want to go then to the lowest bidder. Uh, we don't think that that's often a good idea because the supplier that offers you the lowest price is typically going to be one in one of these emerging economies that is not uh, the most capable. So uh, we tell our clients in most cases don't choose the lowest bidder because the cost that you pay to the supplier is only part of the overall equation. You will spend some time and money managing the supplier. You may spend some time and money in traveling to the supplier or them traveling to you depending on the volume of business. So uh, you really have to consider the overall cost. And some of these supplies or hidden costs can be vastly different between supplier A and supplier B who are supplying what looks like essentially the same product or service. So uh, we think it's very important that you take a look at the big picture and try and drop uh, the, the appropriate suppliers based on the risk factors and the overall cost. We also think for the same reason that it's important to measure productivity per person year. Don't simply look at the dollars per hour you might be paying effectively for labor costs, but also look at uh, how much work you are getting out of a person based in China or India or a similar person based in the United States or Canada or Europe. And we think that in most cases, if you manage this well, you will find that offshore productivity will increase quarter by quarter, year by year. And we have many examples where Specialized functions have been offshored to the point where the emerging, conduct, uh, emerging country productivity exceeds Western benchmark. And this is a great place for you to be as a customer because this means that you have now trained your offshore partner or your offshore employees to be really specialized and good at that function. And, uh, and, 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 and then now you're not subject to the vagaries of uh, rising labor prices or uh, the vagaries of foreign exchange rates as much as others might be. Number nine on my list with uh, relating to offshoring and outsourcing has to do with commitment. Uh, if you are starting out with offshoring, chances are that uh, uh, some things will go awry. And when things go wrong, you want to be sure that you have the stomach to withstand it and that your colleagues and the skeptics within your organization have the stomach to withstand it and that the projects or the initiatives don't get canceled. So uh, we advise our clients to take small steps in the beginning and to manage the expectations of your peers and, uh, and of top management that this is, this is a journey. It's not like you'll see the immediate benefits on the very first initiative. And some of our clients may take a year or two before they start realizing benefits. Others jump right in and the, either the volume is high enough or the d difference in, uh, in performance is high enough that they see, they see hugely beneficial results in Q1 in the first quarter that you, that you start. But that's not always the case and you have to be ready for, uh, for uh, being able to deal with the unexpected. Uh, so commitment is a key issue in going, uh, in going global. If you aren't committed, don't do it. Uh, questions came up uh, in the registration about intellectual property protection, and this is an important area, but in, in some ways that might be different from what you think. So, so I call it imbalanced IP protection. If you're dealing with the large companies, particularly out of India, you will find that IP is really not a serious issue. But they know how to deal with it, they know how to respect it, they know how to respect confidentiality as well as intellectual property. But when you get down to the second or third tier suppliers, or maybe some who are immature or are growing very rapidly, then you do want to go beyond the contract. In fact, even for the top suppliers, I do recommend specific training sessions and guidance so that you, you're sure that they understand IP protection in the same manner that you do, and they're not being overprotective or underprotective based on the specific circumstances that, uh, that dictate your business needs and their reality is offshore. So often people tell me, well, I put all of this in the contract, now I can sleep easy. And that is a mistake because contracts help, but it's much more than just having it in the contract. You have to highlight exactly how this will work. You have to audit it. You have to train your suppliers and their employees and make sure that, uh, that this process is being followed 
vigorously. At the same time, you have to practice what you preach. It's really important that, uh, that you demonstrate that you and your suppliers, employers are also respecting the intellectual property of others. So for example, I was visiting a subsidiary of one of our uh, Canadian clients in India and discovered that uh, they were having a party and they were the, 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 the people were uh, playing some video games uh, that were based on, uh, on illegally copied uh, software. And I said, you know, that probably doesn't convey a very good impression if you permit that to happen in your cafeteria, because if some of your people can steal from from a different type of company, then they feel that perhaps stealing from the employer or stealing from the employer's customer isn't such a bad thing uh, as well. Uh, so you really have to have a consistent image. Most of the employees in these offshore locations are young. They are, they are just out of college. Uh, they are in their 20s, uh, maybe their early 30s, and uh, they watch very carefully uh, the behavior of their employer as well as the behavior of their superiors. So you want to be sure that you have a consistent image. You also want to make sure that if your work involves a degree of creativity and search, that you don't stifle that process. I was once at a, a, at a service provider in Shanghai, and they had blocked access to the World Wide Web to the point where their employees really could not conduct some of the work that they needed to do for their, uh, for their, uh, uh, for their ultimate customer in an effective manner. And uh, there was some dissatisfaction about the quality of work coming in. Well, the reason was that uh, the, the uh, programmers were working with a subset of the tools available to them, and many of them were going home uh, at the end of the day to, and spending two and three hours uh, scouting around for solutions on bulletin boards that they couldn't uh, have access to at work. Uh, that's not a smart way to, to, to run an offshore operation, uh, regardless of your concerns about IP. There's always ways that limited access can be granted at work. So you've got to have a balanced approach towards IP and confidentiality. While the U.S. economy is still running pretty slow and unemployment is high, you have to remember that the situation in the emerging economies is quite different. Uh, there is still a, a substantial uh, demand for talent, and uh, uh, people are uh, not hesitant to switch jobs at a slight increase in salary. So you have to offer good working conditions you have to offer an environment where people want to come to work for you or for your supplier, uh, and, and there are things that uh, that we advise our clients to do in order to be able to to uh, to help their uh, offshore entity be uh, be a good place to work and an attractive place for for employees to want to apply for a job. More important than recruitment is retention. Uh, uh, and, and I have this concept that we talk about called the training treadmill, where you hire fresh employees. They don't know how your job is to be done, so the supplier or your own people in the offshore location train them. They, they start to become good, and eight months to 18 months later, they quit and go somewhere else, and then you start the process all over again as if you're on a treadmill. That's not a good way to go. And so you really want to focus on what will create a high degree of retention. For some of your most talented employees offshore, uh, you, you can offer the opportunity to come and spend some time at your onshore facilities here in the West. You can offer them some training uh, or some classes or perhaps even a degree program after a certain number of years. Uh, these are the kinds of things that can start to create uh, loyalty beyond a conventional retirement program or uh, the types of things that might work for a 35, 45-year-old employee. Uh, you also, in a country like India, have to talk about involving the extended families in the decision. It's not just the employee themselves. Uh, sometimes a person may quit even though they like the work because the company isn't respected by the parents or by the parents-in-law or sometimes the parents-in-law-to-be. And uh, it's always good to have that connectivity with, with the extended community so that you know what might be going on in the minds of the employees.
we find that communication is really important. And this boils down to trust between the employees in the West and the employees in the developing economy. Uh, the methods of communication between the two countries are quite different. And so you have to be sure that you use a method that is appropriate for your counterparts. Uh, it is not common to use voicemail in, in many of these countries. And, and uh, it is only now that Americans are becoming comfortable with texting. Uh, historically, we've used email for work and texting for more for social purposes. Whereas in, in a country like China or India, texting tends to be a very prominent way of communicating for work. So you have to be sure that each side is learning how to bridge this gap. Because you'll be working asynchronously, uh, for the most part, the folks in, in, a, in a country such as China or India come into work as you're going home, it's important for asynchronous communication to work effectively. And you must know how to write emails and uh, word documents that are readily understood by someone in another culture uh, without a lot of metaphor, with a very clear and short sentences so that people can, uh, can understand what you're saying uh, without much difficulty. Uh, we call this building a common vocabulary, uh, building some processes that uh, everybody understands on both sides of the world. Now, despite all of this, there is really no substitute for face-to-face -face contact. So we think that if, if your volume of work is sufficient to justify travel back and forth, uh, you certainly want to do that. If not, then you want to use a third party such as ourselves, uh, because uh, Amrit has people in both countries, and we do travel on behalf of many clients, so we can include you in, in, in one of our trips. So it's something that uh, you definitely want to consider. Uh, it's very important to have messengers going back and forth between the onshore and the offshore location. We're going at a pretty good clip here. Let me see if any questions have come in in the meantime. And there were some questions from registration. Uh, someone had asked about, is China a good place for data entry? And yes, absolutely. You can perform data entry projects in China, in the Philippines, in India, and in some near shore locations as well. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, many of the uh, employees in China may or may not be fully aware of English. So it depends on the material you are entering. If it's numbers, it's absolutely no problem. If it is handwritten material, then chances are that, uh, that uh, China will be more challenging. If it is uh, printed or typed up material or uh, stuff being transferred from one, one format to another, then you have to look at the experience of the supplier and the staff, and you might look at, as I said, the Philippines, at China, at India, Sometimes we send work like this to countries such as Vietnam as well. And uh, there are good solutions in each of these countries. So it really depends on your particular situation and the particular suppliers that you're considering. I had a question about what are the best practices to ensure quality coming in from China and India. And I would say that these, uh, the 10 points that I'm presenting, most of them would apply to helping create better quality. It's not just about the product or service. It's also about the communication. It is about uh, employee retention. It is about all of these factors that you must take into account in being able to build quality. We had another question come in. Just a moment here. The cost of living is increasing in India, so is it still attractive for U.S. customers for, to get the 30% cost saving? Then yes, this is a question that comes up all the time. So India is a country of 1.1 billion people. Okay. That's 1,100 million people. Today, in the entire outsourcing and offshoring world, there are less than 5 million employees. Uh, I think the actual direct employment is only a little over 2 million. 700 million Indians make less than $2 a day. So when, when we say costs are increasing, what it means is that the, hey, yes, the 
food costs are going up for all Indians. This is really affecting the poor and the poorest more than your IT or outsourced worker, uh, because school for food doesn't make up that much of their of their overall uh, expenditure. For the people that are working for the types of companies that uh, you are concerned about, the salaries at the upper level are going up because of demand. But the salaries at the lower levels aren't going up that much because they are able to expand the pool from the 2 million to the 3 to the 5 to the 10. I would say up to 40 or 50 million people can work in this industry in India over time. And the, the, uh, the basic cost will not go up dramatically after adjusting for inflation. The issue really is more than uh, around training. How fast can you train people? So the large Indian companies that now employ 100,000 employees or more were just less than 5,000 people 10 years ago. They've been growing at 35, 40, 50 percent per year, year after year after year. And so the challenge really is how can they train people fast enough? So it appears that, uh, that there is a shortage, but there's no long-term shortage. And even in the short term, we find that sometimes even though average salaries are going up, median salaries come down because... There's so many people who are being hired at the low level. Let me continue and then I'll get back to some of the other questions that have come in. Let's talk a little bit about cross-cultural challenges. In the West, we tend to be direct communicators. We call a spade a spade. We want something, we ask for it. If we want to say yes, we say yes. If we want to say no, we say no. And you can generally trust a yes to mean a yes and a no to mean a no. This is generally not the case in dealing with Asia. People are socialized not to be direct. It's considered rude to say no. And so you have to learn how to read between the lines. And this is a skill that takes years of practice. Although you should start immediately as you start dealing with with Asian cultures and, uh, and, and, and not get frustrated by it. So you have to be very, very careful. Uh, so you, you may see that uh, employees in, this, in these countries tend to be very accommodating to customers' needs. At the same time, you have to recognize that there are limits to how accommodating you should let them be. So you should set your own limits about what someone should do in order to be able to to meet your aggressive or unreasonable schedule, because in the long run, the relationship will suffer if the supplier keeps doing things that are completely unreasonable time after time after time. If you do this too many times, there'll be an occasion where you really need them, and they could have done something, and they may end up saying no. So it's very important that you, you don't simply gauge your supplier by the words they say, that they keep accommodating you, but also by some standard of reasonableness. And, and what this boils down to uh, in, in, in dealing with Asian cultures, particularly China and India, is that sometimes relationships are far more important than facts. So make sure that you focus on the relationship, make sure that you over-communicate, and make sure that you're sensitive to these needs, and you will find that your offshore suppliers can sometimes deliver much better quality than the contract requires. They'll go out of the way, they'll do things that... Uh, that are uh, going to be helpful to you. Uh, the other factor to consider is, is what psychologists refer to as power distance. In Asian cultures, employees are taught not to question their superiors, and children are taught not to question adults. So this concept of power distance uh, travels into the workplace, and even when they're doing work for Western companies, it is hard for Chinese and Indians and other Asians to get out of this, this mindset that the boss must know best. Uh, we know in the West that working with knowledge workers implies that often the, the subordinate knows far more than the boss, and this, it is not considered a threat to the boss if the subordinate questions him or her and if the subordinate disagrees with him or her. You'll find this behavior very hard to elicit in the in the East, and so you have to be very careful that you don't end up with people trying to read your mind, either as the boss or as the customer, and not telling you unpleasant or 
or uh, or, or otherwise uh, uh, contradictory information to your worldview. Uh, you have to uh, you have to be humble. You have to be communicative, and you have to really try hard to elicit such information. But it can be done. It is worth doing. As I say, it's much harder than it sounds, especially at first. Uh, but it is definitely worth uh, taking the effort to do so. Let's see. We can answer another question or so here. I think the question is about near shore versus uh, far away uh, sourcing. So sourcing. Well, normally near shore refers to countries such as Mexico or the Caribbean. The questioner is giving examples such as Chile and Brazil, which are uh, still quite distant from the U.S. So I think he's really asking more about time zone proximity. But there's a definite cultural difference between North American culture and Latin American culture. So that barrier is still the same. The fact that some parts of Chile and Brazil have uh, proximity to the U.S. in terms of time zones can be an advantage. And we know of several companies that have set up operations in Chile, in Peru, in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil, in addition to operations in India or the Philippines, to be able to offer uh, work uh, availability in multiple time zones uh, for the convenience of the customer. So moving on, uh, number three on my list of the top ten mistakes that people make is dependence on the contract. And this is something that I think is more prevalent in American companies than European companies. Uh, our tendency is to assume that the lawyers will take care of all problematic issues. Uh, and while contracts are important, contracts are in India and China are the beginning and not the end. So just because you put it in the contract doesn't mean that it's going to happen. So you need to take some additional effort to make sure that the parties understand that which parts of the contract you, you expect them to pay extra attention to, how do they set up a, uh, an adherence mechanism, what happens when something goes wrong, what is the protocol, how do they report it. You can't assume that the, that every supplier in these countries will, will have a way to deal with all of that. Also keep in mind that enforcement of a contract violation may not be so simple in some of these economies. So you have to you have to rely on the relationship often rather than upon the literal word of the contract. So you have to have the ability to deal with both. We are going a little faster than usual, which is fine. Let me talk about the last two of the issues that come up. We are often engaged by clients who have a troubled relationship with their partner or who are looking to modify or change the relationship. Our working assumption in every one of these cases is that we want to try and make the current partner's relationship work rather than look for a new partner for the client. And wherever possible, we, we advise our clients on how best to do that. But there are some situations where either the client's world has changed quite a bit since they started, or the supplier's world has changed quite a bit since they started. Or sometimes uh, there was just a misunderstanding when you, when you first brought on the partner. If one of these things are true, then you do want to disengage from the relationship, and you want to do it in an orderly manner. You want to be sure that your clients or your internal users don't suffer. Uh, this is one of those things that is far better negotiated at the time that you first sign a deal as opposed to once you are in trouble. So make sure that if you are doing a new deal that you do take something like this into account and often people will come to us with, with these types of questions and they are setting up a new relationship. Finally, it is important to understand that the world has changed in the last couple of years. And for some people, this means that they need to 
change their outsourcing relationship. Some of your suppliers may be at risk because their key customers have uh, either gone bankrupt or have cut back orders to the point where the survival of your supplier is at stake. For some other suppliers, what has happened is that they've received far more business uh, as a result of the slowdown because uh, uh, the, the, their customer may have been dividing work between two companies and they cancelled work from another company and now these guys are getting much more work and that's causing your work at this supplier to suffer. Uh, so you have to be cautious about these things. You have to be aware of these types of changes. You also have to be aware of changes in the financial situation. One of your suppliers may come up for sale. Maybe maybe their investors are, uh, are looking to cash out or maybe their other investments are in trouble. So you may be able to get a good deal. Uh, if you have your antenna up, if you are listening carefully to the market as well as to your suppliers and their peers, you will get this kind of information to the point where you can uh, take advantage of it uh, for your the benefit of your company, or you can prevent a disaster or debacle from happening on your side. So uh, inertia is generally not a good thing in the light of the changes that have happened in the economy uh, since uh, since the fall of Lehman Brothers in September, August uh, 2008. Often we, we are being engaged uh, by our clients uh, to, to determine proactive solutions in the lights of these changes. All along I've been showing you pictures from my travels in China and India, and uh, the picture on this slide is taken from uh, the Shanghai Metro uh, when I was there last. So we, are, we are at the end of our presentation. Uh, 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 my contact information is up here. And if you register on our website, uh, you can get information about our future webinars, as well as uh, some white papers and other materials we have that are available to registered users only. There are other questions that have come up. A few of you are asking about slides. So those of you who have attended the webinar, if you send an email, uh, we are going to see, we may be recording this webinar, and if the recording is successful, we'll send you a link to it. Uh, we may also be able to send slides to, to some of the registrants. So just send an email to usa at amrit.com with your full contact information, and we'll figure out what we can get to you. We had one final question about the cost and benefits of software development and how they are changing over the years. This goes back to the question about costs, I think. And, and generally speaking, while, while salaries at the mid and higher levels have gone up in India, the overall cost of the offerings has not increased that much because they are able to do work uh, mostly by people who are of a lower skill level where the salary increases have not been uh, that dramatic. So again, this will depend on your particular product or service, uh, but inflation of overall costs has not been a major reason why people come to us to change suppliers or to renegotiate the deals. Uh, many of the suppliers have been able to maintain fairly stable costs uh, over the last three to four years. Now this will start to change. I think we all know that one of the side effects of the last couple of years is that we may be heading in, in some kind of inflationary period, particularly in these uh, developing economies where, uh, where uh, the economies are still growing and food prices continue to rise. So you may see some increases. I don't think they will be to the point where the economics of offshoring will be seriously compromised. I think there's still a lot of room to go for that. Well, I think we are at the end of our interactive session here. So uh, we did finish a little bit early today, and I appreciate the time from all of you. What I would suggest is that when you, when, when, when you exit the webinar, please close the applet rather than 
uh, shut down your computer and you will get a 30 second three question survey. We love to get the answers from those because it helps us improve future webinars and uh, gives us ideas on what, what we might be missing or what you, you know, what is your opinion of today's webinar. So please take a second to, to fill those out and uh, we, will, we will react to those in the future. Thank you so much for joining today and uh, we will we will stay in touch thank you